way on trying to perfect my ability to be a damn good uh, intervener in the crisis of homelessness as it presented itself on the streets of London and other cities and then in other parts of the world. So I started at the sharp end of things where the problem presented itself at its most acute, which was that people were on the streets and there were all sorts of, there was a myriad reasons why they were on the streets. But what I was saying, let's remove them from the streets, but first of all, let's stop them committing crime. Let's get them out of, out of um, wrongdoing uh, by shoplifting or prostitution or by um, aggressive begging. So I started very, very much there, and I think it's important because I want to take you on a kind of journey as to why I end up with the future when at one stage I was very, very much in the present. And to some extent, the only reason I was in the present was because the past had failed. So the people who you met on the streets were people who had accumulated all sorts of problems in their past uh, and it presented itself as somewhere an, an inability to find a place to live but also an inability to function in the economy, an inability to have family, children, uh, an inability to have a rich and healthy life. So the crisis was where I started, in a very, very myopic, small-minded, but incredibly essential place to be, which is where the crisis is. I was a kind of one-man, uh, mid sans frontier, you could say. Uh, and I therefore revolted against a lot of other people who were working on homeless people as though they were very, very difficult, uh, almost uh, uh, con uh, cocktails of, of social failure. And they were dealing with the cocktail of social failure. And I said, I thought that the first thing we've got to do is get them out of the sticky stuff, let them out of crime, get them out of wrongdoing, get them out of having violated other people in order to violate themselves because many of them had drink and drug problems. After 10 years, and I, as, as I reported in, as, as was reported in the article that I did in the House magazine, after 10 years I was asked by the Times uh, what am I going to do next after 10 years of the big issue? And I said, you know, I'm kind of sick of continuously mending broken clocks. So what I want to do is prevent the clocks from breaking in the first instance. So I kind of, that was a, a, a bit of rhetoric because it was so difficult to talk to anybody about prevention. It was very difficult to talk to her Majesty's Government of whatever political shade, when you said, actually, why don't we move more to prevention? Why don't we put an enormous amount of money and effort into prevention? Why do we not try and prevent the problem happening so that therefore we don't have to clean up? Anyway, after many, many years, I developed a methodology called PEC which is Prevention, Emergency, Coping and Cure. And it was the simplest and dumbest methodology because all it meant was that when you encountered a social intervener, you could look at them and you could say, where are they? Are they a preventer? Are they emergency? Are they coping? Are they cure? Or are they all? And very few organisations are all. 80% of money that is spent in social intervention is spent in emergency. We are very, very good. Human beings are brilliant when things go wrong. We are absolutely so clever. And our whole philosophical thinking is based around responding to the horse when it has left the stables very suddenly. And I was cheesed off, and one of the reasons I applied to join the House of Lords, sorry for this rather long, turgid 
introduction, because you read all this, or you know about this about me. And when I entered the House of Lords, I said, I've come here to dismantle poverty. And that is a bit like saying, I've come here to give us a permanent summer, and that we're all going to be living a wonderful life. I came into the House of Lords to prevent poverty from happening. And I came into the House of Lords to dismantle poverty. Now, I tell you, there has been no administration that's ever, ever got that one right. Because most administrations are always ducking and diving, bobbing and weaving. And as a person who sits on the cross bench and holds his cross benchness very seriously, all my friends are rank Tories. Sorry. <laughs> or divine labourites. <laughs> and I mix and match with everyone. I have no problem at all. I don't really care about the nomenclature of your po political uh, position, largely because I have been hurt very much in my work by uh, the right and helped, and hurt very much by the left and helped. So it comes and goes. But anyway, I came in to dismantle poverty. I also realise that actually if you analyse the work of this house and the other place, about 70% of the work, these are not my figures, about 70% of our time and effort and energy and resources goes into the question of poverty. Now, if you look at poverty, we might be talking about 20% of the people in this country, 22% of adults, 33% of our children. So we're talking about a minority, but an incredible amount of minority, a very large minority. But it kind of the world works for, you know, quite a number of people, certainly the majority. But that small section, even though it's very large, and we're all hyperventilated about how large it is, that takes up 70% of our work. That really ties us up. Every one of us, in some way or other, is hyperventilated about the size of that. I don't think that we can find a way of doing anything about poverty unless we reinvent the future. Unless we do, we bring the future forward to today. And unless we can find a methodology, uh, the laws to go with it, I don't think we're going anywhere. So you could say that if anybody says to me, why did you start in poverty and now you're all on about climate change and all sorts of apparently erudite things for the person who is on the street suffering? What I'm saying is if we want to stop having our streets filled up with the most needy, we need to embrace tomorrow now as well as doing the Monson from Frontier thing, which is actually create brilliant emergency responses now. But we have to engage with the future. I was blessed by, uh, uh, by being a person who wandered around on many, many occasions and slept in virtually all of the shires. Uh, rough, I have to say. Uh, and that's how I got to know Great Britain as it was then before it became the United Kingdom. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time in Wales. I like Wales because um, I do like Wales. I, I, well, I, you can't but love Lord Roberts. <laughs> Excuse me. Sir. But I spent a bit of time in Wales. And then just after the Brexit... Uh, um, referendum, I heard that the Welsh Assembly were very interested in looking at what we were doing on the PEC thing. 
when we were looking, is this project about prevention? Is this project about emergency? Is this project about coping? Is this project about cure? So if somebody wanted to invest their money, they would invest their money on the basis of, well, actually, I'd like to get people out of poverty rather than make them comfortable. And the Welsh Assembly were looking at this on the basis of the fact that they wanted to save money because they realised after Brexit it would be possible that there wouldn't be so much money around considering that they get a shed load of money from Europe. And I was very touched by that because they took it on and they talked to me as though I was a grown-up. And that's wonderful when you're not a grown-up. The other thing is all this information started to come down about this idea of a future generations legislation and it was passed into law and they have a future generation uh, commission uh, and we started to work with them we started to look at what they were doing and every one of the answers that I was looking for with regard to preventing our need to spend 70% of our time and energy on having to handle the problems of maybe 20 to 30% of the people in this country. Every one of those questions was answered for me because the future generation legislation and act and commission that they do in Wales, Wales leading the way in the world, I have to say. Please, please. <laughs> Let me throw out some of these <laughs> Welsh people. <sorry. laughs> um, and the very idea that one of the countries of the United Kingdom, I, I describe them as a bijou economy, had the space and the time and the energy and the desire to change the way that they encountered the future by creating the future generations legislation. This was to me everything that I wanted to do. I could actually go home. All I needed to do was to turn the UK Welsh. How about that? Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so that is my thinking. I am hoping that we open a debate today. I'm really pleased that we have such a long list of people who will begin to talk about how we, in, how we need a future generation legislation, how we need to change the way that we do our budgeting, how the way that we need to change our way, how we supply our children with education, how we need to stop doing ridiculous things like closing libraries or making it impossible for our bookshops to uh, destroying the intellectual space that exists on our high street. What are we going to do about that? I would say the future generations about preventative spending is the way forward. So in a way I've only really come here today to start the ball rolling. I will be uh, uh, um, I will be inaugurating a private member's bill. I had a private member's bill a few years back about the need to give honesty and integrity to people in need who were paying so much for their credit. What I really want to do now is to move the argument on. Let us embrace the future. Let's not be frightened of the future. If we do not do what we have to do about embracing the future and looking very, very carefully at the legislation that has been carried out in Wales and the Commission and their first four or five years, then I think we are missing a major chance. May I also say that there is a real, real problem that we have. And the problem is that we are not the only ones who are hyperventilated about the future. The public is getting more hyperventilated. My 12-year-old daughter, who has organised uh, strikes 
around the environment is getting hyperventilated. My 14-year-old son, my 43-year-old son, my 53-year-old daughter, my 42-year-old daughter, everyone around me is getting hyperventilated and excited about the possibility of changing the future. And that means that we have to bring the future nearer. And the best methodology, I think, is if we adopt a future generations uh, bill, I mean, law. Act, sorry. Forgive yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Be agreed to.